I just wanted to welcome all of you here to the Battery for a very exciting evening um, where we're going to hear from our Global Scientific Advisory Council members. It's um, really, we had a wonderful meeting today with them and lots of exciting content for the Flash Talks. Um, so we are at an exciting time in the organization. We have um, over 12,000 youth voices, 480 schools in 35 states. So we are mobilizing and um, having courageous conversations across the nation, which is helping um, our mission go forward. So on that note, I'd love to show a video of the, um, some of those voices who were recently in a summit um, across the nation, and you'll hear from them. Change Your Mind is absolutely necessary for high school students because it helps push the idea that mental health is just as important as physical health. Being a teenager in 2022, it's really not like any other generations in the past, I mean, especially with the COVID pandemic. Our high school experience has been extremely different from all other students. I've definitely seen more anxiety and depression and suicidal ideation than ever before. Bring Change to Mind has brought the ability for us to have an open conversation about mental health and mental illness. This is the most challenging time in our history to be your age for all of us for mental health and you guys and girls are the pioneers of ending the stigma. Brain Change to Mind creates this backbone and this feeling of this greater movement, especially with these summits and like these spaces where we can come and meet people from other schools. The great thing about the Bring Change to Mind Club with the way that it's funded is that our students can focus on putting on quality events for the whole school population. No one's excluded. The club leader at the time, she actually asked me to join because of the fact that she saw I was going through a tough time. Honestly, I've never had anybody outreach to me the way that they did. It really helped me because I was able to learn more about mental health in general and I was able to talk to other people and start a conversation about that. The focus of Bring Change to Mind is to make sure that students feel supported and that they can talk about their issues and be able to seek help. I've been struggling with mental illnesses from a really young age. It was just something that, as a Latina, wasn't really talked about in my family. So I really started to connect with Bring Change to Mind. And I can definitely see a change in just how those conversations go with my family members and how I can not only help them, but help them help me. I really dealt with some mental health problems like my sophomore year, and without Brain Change to Mind, I probably wouldn't have recognized that. A lot of us have really been kind of forced to really be independent for ourselves and really figure things out on our own, and after coming back to school, we're able to kind of come together using Brain Change to Mind as a club and a community and restart that conversation. I joined Brain Change to Mind because I realized that people were lacking the human-to-human -human connection, and they felt very isolated and in need of support. When we came back in person, we found a growing membership, students now being more aware of the effects of mental illness and you know wanting to maintain their mental health. This club has been able to help me spread that word by having the voices of students doing that work. Most students want to hear from students more so than they want to hear from adults. I actually got through my depression, it actually greatly improved my cognitive ability and stuff with dealing with my emotions and it, it's just been great for me, honestly. I think being a teenager is a lot of just finding ways to connect with people. As you can see, these courageous conversations are creating a network of leaders and um, people that are connecting and finding community and hope. And it's just a really exciting time for our organization to be building off of that and growing. So on that note, I would like to introduce our intrepid founder, award-winning actress and advocate, the lovely Glenn Close. I'm incredibly moved by what we just saw because I thought 
if only when my sister walked out of high school at ninth grade, never went back, fell through the cracks of my family, if only she had had a Bring Change to Mind Club. She would have had a totally different life. And I have to say that Jesse, <laughs> right there, and Kaylin, uh, are doing incredibly well. Um, it's not, it, Kaylin, who has uh, schizoaffective, schizoaffective disorder, is um, managing his illness in beautifully. He's married, he's a painter. Jesse, you know, it's, she's, she is writing a book about uh, going through Kaylin's first break and as a mother who had, was undiagnosed with bipolar disorder, what that was like. She's calling it Silence You, which is what he wrote on the wall in big black letters when he was going through his break. Silence You. I think back to 10 years ago when Jesse and Kaylin were di diagnosed, they came up against stigma. Kaylin, who you see, was a beautiful, beautiful boy. And he was kind of the, the head of the gang. And he went to the hospital for two years, and when he came out, none of his friends came back. None. None. That was stigma. Jessie, when she was diagnosed, had a little girl, and she was afraid to talk about it because she thought, Maddie wouldn't be uh, allowed to, to play or wouldn't be allowed to have friends come over to their house. Um, so it was very real to them that while they were trying to figure out how to manage their chronic illness, uh, they had to deal with, with stigma, which in many ways was even worse than what, than what they were dealing with is, with their illnesses. So, uh, you know, of course, they're my family. And, and um, I learned very fast that stigma is the most difficult aspect of mental illness uh, to deal with, the hardest. And I guess uh, that was a challenge. And we, you know, I, I had friends, uh, Brandon Staglenstein right there, son of, yeah, son of um, Garen and Sherry. Garen and Sherry helped found Bring Change to Mind. They had their own organization. Um, in fact, the people who sat with me around the table in the library um, in New York um, at uh, the club, what the, uh, I've just gone blank, what? Fountain House. Yeah, Fountain House, where I'd, you know, volunteered and, and, and was able to look into the faces and hear the stories of the people that I wanted to learn how to advocate for. Anyway, the way they helped found Bring Change to Mind. And um, I had no idea what I was getting into. None whatsoever. I thought, well, make PSAs. And uh, we made our first PSA in Grand Central Station. And um, that, you know, that then it's history. And here we are, 10 years later, Pamela Harrington has been a brilliant, brilliant leader. Yeah. Yeah. And we're still learning. Um, and what I'm very excited uh, about tonight is you will hear from our distinguished, some of them, not all of them, but some of our distinguished scientists. Um, because I always felt you want, you, you know, to do good, you have to kind of know that you're actually moving the needle or else it's a waste of time. And um, the, the thing that will root us in that is our scientific advisors and how we can, I, mean, I think what we are pioneering here will have huge repercussions in the future um, if we keep growing and, and having the distinguished uh, people who are helping us um, like we do now. So I am so proud to, to introduce Dr. Stephen Henshaw 
and Dr. Bernice Pesco Salido. Where are you? There you are. <laughs> um, who are, are you co heads? Co heads of our scientific advisory board. They keep us honest. And they are pioneers and they are brilliant. And many of their students are here, well, Steve's. Um, so, you know, from generation to generation, you all will have a, will change, help change the world as far as this issue is concerned. So thank you for being here. Yeah. So thanks for being here tonight and I hand it over to you. Okay, I'll go first. I want to start where Glenn ended, which is that maybe we keep bring change to mind honest, but the bring change to mind keeps us honest. Uh, Steve and I, I'll speak for myself, I'm sure Steve can speak for himself, as a basic scientist. I'm a sociologist by training, and I was studying... <laughs> 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 Yay! Okay. <laughs> and I was studying three things. I was studying pathways to mental health care, I was studying stigma, and I was studying suicide. And um, I, when I got a call one day from that lady, and when that lady calls and says, are you going to put up or shut up with the knowledge you have, you say yes. So we're here because we know that one of the things that we can help provide is a foundation for the work that is done. Without the kind of work that we hope to do for Bring Change to Mind, we don't know what the target is. So it's hard to know if you're moving the needle if you don't know at the beginning what kind of target that you're hoping to hit. So when we first started this, um, Bring Change to Mind was just an idea in Glenn's mind. And so to begin with Bring Change to Mind, we sought out the most senior, the most esteemed, the most respected global leaders in stigma research. And that was our first decade. And that really did set a great foundation for the two legs on which Bring Change to Mind walks, family and science. But now we're, we're Bring Change to Mind Scientific Advisory Board 2.0. And we decided it was time for a shift. Bring Change to Mind is stable. It's known as a, a valid and pioneering leader in this area. And we thought, it's time to bring on the youngins. It's time to bring those people who are the next generation, the pioneers of change, um, increasing the focus on issue, issues of diversity, from issues of race, ethnicity, culture, geography, LGBTQ+, all of those things that have come to the fore in addition to stigma. So that's what we're doing now, and tonight you will hear from some of those new leaders, the next generation, that will bring change to mind into the future. And to continue that discussion, I'm gonna bring up Steve Hinshaw because we're gonna talk about one of those directions. He's gonna take it farther. But one of the things that we've begun talking about is we knew what the original targets were, but now there's a new idea, a new theory out there called what matters most. And that really has to do with issues of tailoring it down to what people need, no matter where they live and who they are. So Stephen, take that forward on terms of issues of personhood. Thanks, Bernice. You have a program, and you'll see the words on the front of it. Stigma, personhood, culture, context, and humanization. Those are big concepts. But let's pause for a minute. It's a really contentious time nationally and internationally. Stigma remains all too potent a force. But thanks to Bernice's research, published last December in JAMA Open Network, we're seeing for the first time in many, many years of similar measures, repeated longitudinal designs, cohort studies with representative samples, a significant dip in the desire for social distance toward people with depression. At the same time, we didn't see a dip with respect to schizophrenia or substance abuse. 
So we still got a long way to go. But we may be on the verge of a sea change. And as Bernice's data and many other data sources will tell you, the source of that change is with young people. It's people under 25 and 30 who are the direct participants in what might be cohort replacement. Tomorrow's leaders of today's youth will model a different set of attitudes and values and behaviors with respect to developmental differences. So can our country, can our world continue to thrive if human potential for people with neurodevelopmental differences, people with mental disorders, continue to be shunned and told that they're out of the spotlight? Well, but think. Silicon Valley is now seeking people with ASD to be coders. People with ADHD may do more outside the box thinking than neurotypical people. People with depression may see some of the existential dilemmas facing the human condition more sensitively than neurotypical people. People with bipolar disorder are among the world's leaders among entrepreneurs, among scientists, entertainers, if they get appropriate treatment. What's fundamental, and we'll come back to this later after our flash talks, is who is a person? Who's a human being? It's every one of us. You're not limited by your mental disorder. You're not limited by your neurodevelopmental disorder if you get appropriate treatment. Society needs to bend and have a broader set of norms for great behavior. But we also realize that people with these conditions are desperately seeking help and there's not enough evidence-based treatment around. So with that in mind, Bernice, I believe it's your turn to introduce our first speaker. Yes, thank you, Stephen. So uh, we said we're going to have a series of flash talks. And our first flash talk today is from, when I said they were youngins, I want to make clear, these are people with established and distinguished records. They're just younger than us, which, you know. Which ain't saying much. Right. <laughs> ain't it true? OK. And uh, so I want to get the title right. So our first flash talk is from Ruth Shim. She is the Director of Cultural Psychiatry and Associate Dean of Diverse and Inclusive Education at UC Davis. And she's going to presenting on humanization and inclusion for all BIPOC youth and flash talk. I wanted to introduce Ruth. Come on up, Ruth. I want to introduce her as uh, my dear friend. She and I worked arm in arm in the National Academy of Sciences report that was published in 2016 on how to end stigma in the United States. And without her, that report wouldn't have been half as good. So what a pleasure for me to introduce a good friend and really just a, a stunning person. So thank you um, to um, everyone here, um, Pamela, Glenn, Bernice, Stephen. Um, uh, these are just really exceptional people, and I'm, I'm so pleased to be um, included um, in the Scientific Advisory Council of Bring Change to Mind. Um, as I said today in our um, council meeting, I've been a huge fan of Bring Change to Mind for, for many, many years, and so it's really great to be um, joining uh, this esteemed group. Um, I'm here to, uh, I have like just a few minutes to um, cover BIPOC youth, and that's, that's a tall order, but um, I really, um, I have just a few kind of facts to share, but I, I wanted to start off and let you know that in the middle of, um, so my work, I'm a psychiatrist and I work at UC Davis and I have a number of responsibilities there. I take care of young people that have just been diagnosed with psychotic illnesses. But in addition to that work, I also spend a fair amount of time um, doing administrative work, working with young medical students. Um, UC Davis is known for having one of the most diverse medical schools in the country. And so we admit more people of color, more people people from disadvantaged backgrounds and probably any other medical school in the country that's not a historically black college and university. Um, and with that, It's wonderful, but with that, I think, comes the challenges of um, the stigma and the discrimination that people of color and minoritized communities face. And so while we were in our Scientific Advisory Council meeting just today, I got an email from one of my talented medical students of color 
Um, and she said, hi, Dr. Shim, I'm, I'm just wanting to speak with you because I've been struggling with anxiety and depression, and I think I need to start um, some medication, but I'm afraid. Um, so let's talk about it. And I, I so appreciate that she could reach out to me and, and we are going to talk about it. But I was struck by the idea that that stigma for a medical student who's going to be a physician is still very um, powerful and very strong and still is um, kind of uh, at the centerpiece of, of, of this problem that we're trying to face. So um, with that, I want to kind of just share with you a little bit of information about um, the role and the challenges of trying to address um, and eliminate stigma in BIPOC youth. So John A. Powell and Stephen Men Men Menendian, they both define othering as a set of dynamics, processes, and structures that engender marginality and persistent inequity across any of the full range of human differences based on group inequities. And so this includes, but is not limited to, religion, sex, race, ethnicity, class, disability, sexual orientation, and skin tone. And so if we're thinking about what othering means, we could think of it as kind of an us versus them mentality. Um, and we can also think about it uh, as negating another person's humanity. And so um, when we other people, we see them as le less worthy of dignity and respect. And so throughout history, we have othered people of color, and particularly youth of color in various settings. So we can look at the education system, the child welfare system, and the juvenile justice system. And so for a couple of examples, a little bit of data, um, black boys make up about 18% of male preschool enrollment, but about 41% of male preschool suspensions. And black girls make up about 19% of female preschool enrollment, but account for 53% of female sus suspensions. And Latinx youth are about 28% more likely to be incarcerated than white youth. And uh, indigenous children have the highest rates of child victimization in the United States. So last year, there was a morbidity and mortality weekly report. This is a report that comes out by the Centers for Disease Control and Pre Prevention, the CDC. And they found that children and adolescents that live in poverty and are from minor minoritized backgrounds fare much worse than their peers in access to mental health care, in identifiable risk factors, and in the prevalence of certain mental health conditions. So a couple of key findings from that CDC report include the impact of adverse childhood experiences and social determinants of health. So things like housing instability, food insecurity, poverty, community violence, and discrimination. So these, experience, as these experiences can have a cumulative effect on stress response in young people. So young people can actually be protected from these harmful effects by positive parent-child relationships, having quality educational experiences, and living in safe neighborhoods. Also from the CDC report, we have some data that shows that suicide rates are the highest among indigenous people compared to all other racial groups, uh, among indigenous young people in particular. And we have to view that data through the lens of historical trauma and specifically thinking about the idea that how, about how indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families and placed into Indian boarding schools and non-tribal foster care. And so that led to, that historical trauma led to intergenerational effects that are um, showing up in the ways that we see um, indigenous youth um, with, with suicidal thoughts. But I will say that the news is not all bleak. Um, we are beginning to understand that cultural practices and traditions have protected black and indigenous children's children from the effects of toxic stress. And so when youth experience positive self-image, when they have caregivers that emphasize belonging and inclusion, the harmful effects of stigma and trauma are greatly reduced. So often the practice of radical belonging and self-acceptance is originating from youth of color. 
And so we as adults have the opportunity to learn from these experts with lived experience on how to be a more inclusive society. So I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up, but in the spirit of focusing on belonging and um, trying to bring belonging into this conversation about youth of color, I want to just leave you with the words of our National Youth Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman. Um, and she said, and we all know, she's a sociologist? Oh, wow. We know, we know her amazing poem, and in that poem she said, we will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens. But one thing is certain, if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, we're in trying to stay on schedule, so uh, we're gonna skip the Q&A and we're gonna have more at the end, but what we're gonna do now is bring up April Smith. April is a second year student studying physics at UCLA, and she's originally from uh, Richmond, Virginia, where she was in her Bring Change to Mind high school club, but she's now moved on. She's our new generation among the college student leaders. And uh, she served on Bring Change to Mind's inaugural Interstate Teen Advisory Board, and she also sat on the first ever mentor board. And she's currently working with Bring Change to Mind as, a, uh, as an ambassador, an alumni ambassador, focusing on mental health in the LGBT BTQ plus community. So welcome April Smith. Thank you so much. Um, good evening. It's an honor to be here today before all of you. Um, five years ago, I came out as a transgender woman. And for the first time, I confronted my mental health issues. And five years later, I'm standing here talking about why youth mental health matters. It, uh, <laughs> it, um, it feels very special. Um, I first heard about Brain Changed Mind through the intercom during morning announcements at Maggie L. Walker High School in Richmond, Virginia. And the announcement went something like, um, sad, anxious, or stressed? Join the brand new mental health club in room 202. Um, you know. <laughs> and I was like, eh, you know. Um, but, then, but then they added, we'll have free cookies. And, and I was like, hmm, what room did you say it was in? Um, and so I left school that day with a free cookie in my hand as the newest member of Bring Change to Mind. Um, and it was such a new experience. Uh, for all my life, I've hidden two things, my mental illness and my gender identity. But once I joined Bring Change to Mind, people were so open about their mental health. And I, I remember this one girl, she, um, she was like, I know I'm depressed, but I'm working on it. And she kind of rolled her eyes and she was like, maybe if Miss Lawson didn't make us read 100 pages of Beowulf every day, I wouldn't have to be on Lexapro. <laughs> um, and uh, it just kind of clicked. It was like, wait, so we can talk about this? I, I can talk about this? Um, I first started experiencing depression and anxiety when I was in middle school, um, when I was in a all-boys Catholic school. Um, and you can kind of paint that picture in your head, a queer, um, feminine 13-year-old thrown into a religious community where being colorful wasn't exactly a virtue. Um, and the worst part was I didn't know why I felt so sad. I didn't know why I felt so afraid. You know, in hindsight, I can say, well, of course you weren't a boy, or of course you were struggling with your mental health, but I didn't know that back then. No one told me what it meant to be mentally ill. No one told me what it meant to be transgender. And 
it got worse and worse, and even after I escaped to a public high school, um, it, even after I escaped to a public high school, and um, things didn't get better, and uh, in sophomore year, I came out as transgender, and my parents took it poorly, and I was exhausted. And a week later, I was in the hospital fighting for my life. But then things slowly began to change. I started seeing a therapist. I started taking medication. I, my relationship with my parents improved. And I realized that things could get better. And a year later, when I heard about a new, brand new mental health club, um, I wanted to stop hiding. I wanted to be able to say that I am a transgender woman with a mental illness, and I am unashamed. <laughs> so fast forward to 2019, I'm now leading uh, my high school's Bring Change to Mind Club as the club president, and I make it my mission, my club's mission, to make the lives of LGBTQ plus students at my school just a little bit easier. And so we decide that we're going to try and amend the uh, school's transgender bathroom policy. And um, because at the time, transgender students would have to go to the teacher's lounge just to pee, and it didn't make any sense. Um, and so we drafted a letter. We talked to the principal. Uh, the principal had meetings with the district superintendent. And after several months, we got it done. And <laughs> I'm, I'm proud to say that five years later, that, um, that policy change continues to help students at my school. Um, you know, for now, I, I hate to put that caveat, but um, we live in a termulous America. Um, and, but that's why we need to keep up our mission. That's why we need to keep up the fight and bring change to mind clubs across the country are leading the way. And that's what's so amazing about bring change to mind, I think. You know, um, it has all these, it's, it's a national organization. It has all these cool celebrities and these big movers and shakers, but at the center of all of it, is the students. And every day, these 15, 16, 17, and 18 year olds are becoming advocates, uplifting voices, and creating real change within their schools and their communities that they know so well and grew up in. And that's what today is all about, I think. It's about joining a movement, about Building, bridge, building a bridge between generations. Because a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, we might have a world that's a little more open, in America that's a little more understanding, a San Francisco that, uh, dare I say, a little more golden. Um, <laughs> because you never know. Because you never know. The money, the time, the support that you've donated here today, it might just come up in the form of a box of cookies at a Bring Change to Mind, Bring Change to Mind Club somewhere in Arizona or New York or Indiana or here in California or maybe even in Virginia. And sometimes all it takes is a cookie. Thank you. That was awesome. April, um, we won't soon forget your inspiring six minutes up here. Thank you so much. So to keep things moving, we have our next flash talk. And I got to know Mark uh, when I read some of his work while he was still a graduate student. And now he's uh, a professor who's recently moved to Harvard University, where I was an undergraduate. And he's now the John Loeb Professor of Psychology at Harvard. And his talk today is Humanization and Inclusion for All, as are all the talks. 
LGBTQ plus youth. Mark, come on up. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Steve, and uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here and to have the opportunity to share um, in eight minutes uh, a little bit of the work that um, my colleagues and I have been doing uh, in the area of what we call structural stigma um, and how it affects the health of LGBT populations. So when you think about uh, the term stigma, you probably immediately think about concrete events and experiences that happen to people, things like uh, hate crimes and bullying or being the target of stereotypes. Um, and those of you who are psychologically minded might also think about some of the psychological responses that members of stigmatized groups have to these concrete events and experiences. Um, things like anticipating rejection or becoming hypervigilant to threat cues in your environment um, or concealing aspects of your stigmatized identity if you're able um, in order to avoid rejection and discrimination. Um, and you wouldn't be wrong for thinking this. There are decades of research from across the social sciences showing that these are forms of stigma that matter for the health and well-being um, of stigmatized as individuals. Uh, at the same time, though, as this figure shows, this is just the proverbial tip of the iceberg. Um, stigma is, of course, much broader than these concrete events and experiences. Um, it's promulgated and reinforced through our social institutions, uh, through the laws and policies that we choose to pass or not pass, uh, and finally, through broad cultural and social norms and attitudes that we have about members of stigmatized groups. Um, and collectively, that's what my colleagues and I call structural stigma. Uh, and what our work is beginning to show is that these structural forces that operate uh, just below the surface can have really profound implications for the health and well-being of members of stigmatized groups, including LGBTQ populations. Um, so I'm going to um, present um, just a couple of really brief studies to give you a sense of how we've gone about uh, trying to um, show some of these effects. Um, so when we started this work, we needed to have a measure of structural and institutional uh, discrimination. Um, and we found that in um, laws and policies. Um, so it will come as no surprise to many of you this room, um, especially after April talk that there's enormous variation in the U.S. across uh, states with respect to the laws and policies that are passed um, regarding sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so this figure shows um, some the distribution of some of these laws and policies um, here in the U.S. So states in red and orange are those states that um, have restrictive laws, laws that are uh, restricting rights and opportunities for LGBT populations, whereas um, the uh, states that are in green are those states that have more expansive um, protections for LGBT populations. And not only is there variation um, across U.S. states, but there's also variation across time. So this figure shows um, some of the changes that have occurred over the past decade. Um, we've seen really um, pronounced uh, improvements uh, in laws and policies for some states, but no changes and even um, regressions um, for, for other states. And so this meant that we had a measure of structural stigma in the form of laws and policies that were changing over um, both geographic time and space. Um, and so we were able to go about um, testing what some of the effects of these changes in laws and policies were on the health of LGBT people. Um, so in the first, um, one of the studies that we did, um, if you could advance the slides, please. This is um, a study that my colleague, um, Julia Raithman, took the lead on. We've been interested in um, asking, do mental health problems increase among LGBT populations following increases in these laws that restrict the rights and opportunities for LGBT populations? Um, so next slide. In this um, study, we uh, compared changes in uh, mental distress among uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals and heterosexual who lived in three states that had recently implemented laws denying services to same-sex couples and public accommodations in the year 2015. And we compared those to changes in mental distress among LGB individuals and heterosexuals who lived in six geographically nearby control states that had really similar demographic characteristics but had not implemented one of these laws denying services to same-sex couples. Um, and our data on sexual orientation and mental health come from these large representative samples of state residents. I should just put an asterisk here that this um, study did not measure gender identity. Um, I could give a whole separate talk about how that's an example of structural stigma in and of itself in terms of the lack of data structures here in the US that have measures um, related to gender identity. Um, but um, for the purposes of time, we can advance the slides um, so I can present the results that we did have related to sexual orientation. So this figure shows the changes in the percentage of adults that experience mental distress um, in the states that have passed these uh, restrictive laws compared to control states stratified by um, sexual orientation status. 
So on the y-axis, the left-hand side um, was the proportion of the population that um, met criteria for mental distress. And on the bottom is the x-axis showing time. So 2014 um, was the baseline year, 2015 was the year the policy was implemented, and 2016 was the follow-up year. So if you can, um, great. So you'll see here that the only group that experienced an increase, a significant increase in mental distress during this time period were the LGB adults who lived in one of those states um, that passed uh, laws denying services to same-sex couples. There's no change in uh, mental distress among any of the other uh, comparison groups. And in fact, um, this was equivalent to a 46% relative increase uh, in LGB adults experiencing mental distress in those states that had passed laws denying services uh, to same-sex couples controlling for a whole host of factors shown there um, at the bottom of the screen. Um, so these, uh, this study and many others that we've done like it um, suggest uh, that social forms of stigma may contribute to adverse mental health outcomes among um, LGBT populations. And um, they raise the really important question of do we have enough supportive mental health providers in those states that have these um, social forms of stigma? Um, so um, we uh, answered that question. This is a study that a doctoral student in my lab just published um, where he came up with a really clever way of um, uh, answering that question. So in this study, um, he measured the um, state support for uh, transgender rights across 33 different state level policies. And um, he identified uh, in a separate sample trans supportive uh, youth mental health providers. Um, and on the uh, map here on the right, again, is showing the distribution of these laws and policies across US states, um, with states in darker blue, uh, where the states that had a less supportive policy, some more restrictive um, uh, policies. Um, on the next slide shows the results. Um, so on the y-axis is um, the trans-specific uh, adolescent mental health um, providers. These are um, those uh, providers who indicate that they um, uh, provide um, supportive mental health care for transgender populations. Um, and on the x-axis is that law and policy indicator. Uh, and what Nathan finds is that these um, supportive trans-specific adolescent mental health provider availability was three times lower in states that had these most restrictive um, policies. Um, and uh, controlling for lots of other risk factors. And so um, this study is suggesting that social forms of stigma not only affect people's mental health, but it also denies them access to the very providers that are most needed in these states um, with high levels of mental health burden. So um, these two studies are the, are the, the bad news, um, that social stigma uh, can affect um, people's mental health negatively. Um, but in a, another set of studies we've been interested um, in the last study I'll talk about today in the flip side of this question, namely, um, can we imagine a world that doesn't have these disparities? Um, so what happens when we see structural forms of stigma removed um, from states? Do we see a concomitant decline in the size or magnitude of uh, sexual orientation disparities? And mental health. Uh, it's very difficult to answer that question methodologically, and in fact, we had to go to Sweden to do it because it's one of the few countries that, at a population level, has uh, experienced significant declines in structural stigma um, over the last um, decade or so in terms of laws and policies that also um, has data structures that measure mental health and sexual orientation. So if you go to the next slide, this will show just some of the laws and policies that have changed in Sweden. Um, it's been um, much more uh, progressive in terms of um, changing laws and policies related to sexual orientation and gender identity than we've seen here in the US context. Um, so here are the results for the study. So on the y-axis, again, is showing the percent um, who met criteria for elevated psychological distress. And on the x-axis are the 10-year um, period over which these studies um, uh, were collected. Uh, and you can see here really significant declines in the proportion of gay men and lesbians who met criteria for elevated psychological distress over the course of the study, much stronger than was observed for the um, uh, heterosexual sample. Uh, and But most interesting um, was what happened, sorry, go back just one, um, what happened to the sexual orientation disparity? So you can see here on the far left, um, in 2005, before a lot of these changes happened in laws and policies, gay men and lesbians were about three times more likely to meet criteria for psychological distress as compared to heterosexual. But fast forward 10 years later in 2015, following these declines in laws and policies um, that were restricting uh, rights and opportunities for LGBT people, there's no disparity anymore. Gay men and lesbians are no more likely to meet criteria for um, uh, psychological distress as compared to heterosexuals. So these findings are uh, important because they begin to suggest that these uh, disparities aren't inevitable, but instead are responsive to changes in the social context, and in particular to declines um, in structural stigma. 
Um, so I'll end with the last slide. Um, uh, thinking about stigma as a multi-level construct. Um, stigma uh, occurs at the level of individuals, at the level of interpersonal interactions, and finally, the level of um, social structures and institutions. And if we care about addressing the negative effects of stigma, we need to think about how do we target stigma at each of these levels, um, including uh, the level of social structures. Um, and so I think that's uh, part of the great work that this organization is involved in, and I'm really thrilled to be uh, joining the board and, and, um, and fighting uh, along alongside you in that effort. So thanks again so much for your attention. See what we mean about reinvigorating the board? <laughs> so for our semi-final flash talk, I'd like to introduce two people. First, Dr. Sarah Hickman, who is the team psychologist for the LA Clippers. Uh, with a distinguished background in sports psychology, and Dr. Drew Ramsey, farmer, psychiatrist, nutritionist, who will be talking about humanization and inclusion for all young men. Sarah and Drew. I'm glad we made the semifinals. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> it's hard to follow Mark. <laughs> Well, hi everyone. It's a treat to be here. I feel like um, sitting here not only as a, a scientific advisory council member, but like many of you, as someone who has uh, struggled with his mental health, someone who has a family with many different mental health challenges. And so it's a real treat to be among family in a place where we can be open. Um, we wanted to speak and focus on male mental health. And in some ways, following April, I really want to draw on her strength when I think about so many men and the struggle they have to be open without having to fight for a bathroom or for rights. Uh, that said, male mental health is in a horrible shape. About 70 to 80% of all completed suicides are men. Uh, often they're men with seemingly everything that one would want. We know that there aren't any real programs to help us confront or think about male mental health in America, unlike uh, the wonderful women's mental health departments <clears throat> that so many of my colleagues in, in psychiatry and psychology uh, uh, man and, and women and help um, uh, us understand the peculiarities and specific specificities of women's mental health. Same thing doesn't exist for male mental health. The idea of what makes a good man, what makes a mentally healthy man, what makes a good father, these aren't the things that really are taught to young men. How do we talk about our feelings? How are we allies? Um, how do we do so many of the things that men need to do today? And, and so it's a real treat that Bring Change to Mind has an interest in this, because when we think about where young adolescent men today are, as we, as we saw in the video, they're talking in a new way more openly than I've ever seen in 20 years of treating patients. They are interested in emotional depth, they're interested in their inner worlds, and they're interested in talking about it. And I think we have a huge opportunity to seize on that, uh, to seize on that interest and curiosity about their inner worlds and about modern masculinity, and I think we can define it as something that's gonna serve all of us. So I think uh, men and people who identify in masculine ways can, can uh, do the best of what that offers as opposed to so often what has happened via masculinity, which is not generally good stuff. I think there's a tremendous amount of work to be done. That's why it's a treat to sit here with Sarah and to think about all of her work with organizations uh, that you might not think of as being very savvy and thinking about really pushing mental health and mental fitness to the limits. So, I want to hear with you uh, about your work. I think the, the last thing just to add is that over the past uh, three years, I've been working with Men's Health Magazine and a, a colleague, Greg Scott Brown, to have conversations about male mental health called Friday Sessions. It's on their Instagram page. There are now over 70 conversations about male mental health, ranging from the US Surgeon General to Andy Dunn, a CEO with bipolar disorder, speaking openly about that to a number of artists, athletes, all talking about their mental health problems. When you hear young Jeezy talk about his first session for his panic disorder. Right? It does something to change the conversation. And so I invite you to take a look at that. And, and I want to, Sarah, hear all about your work with the Navy SEALs and with many high-performance athletes. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. And thank you for everyone 
being here and just participating in the conversation, which I think is important to continue having. So I serve as an embedded performance and clinical psychologist. I've been doing this work in a male-dominated environment for the last 20 years. Uh, I worked with the NFL uh, at the league office. I was the embedded team psychologist for the New York Jets and the Brooklyn Nets. And now I, um, after that, I transitioned to working with the Navy in high-performance uh, naval special warfare in Coronado and now with the Clippers and the Kings. I'm actually with the hockey team. So lots of testosterone, lots of uh, you know environments where, to be honest, having these conversations are, are pretty challenging. It's a group that has been you know told that they have to be the strongest and fittest and, and most alpha, if you will, in, in, their, in their world. A lot of their family lean on them. They look to them for advice and guidance. They have a very short, window for their success in their career. So there's a lot of pressure and stress. And they're, you know, put in a position where they can't look weak, what they perceive to have show any weakness. They also face psych a lot of injury, right, in terms of what they're putting their body through, uh, both from their physical body, but also uh, head injuries, as, at least in the NFL. That was a, a very significant issue. And in hockey, it will be. I'm, I'm relatively newer to that sport. Uh, some of the injury list I look at, I just can't believe what these guys go through. Lacerations to the face, a puck to the throat and they're expected to just kind of get taped up and go back in. So to have um, conversations about what it feels like to be lonely or to be hurting or to be sad, to have a significant other pass away suddenly that you know they experience trauma in the middle of a season, uh, these are conversations that we are trying to move forward. So a lot of the leagues have mandated essentially that there's a clinical person available to each of the teams and the NBA and the NFL and the MLB, those are something that's non-negotiable. When I first started working in NBA, uh, I had one player who he suffered a very significant injury that almost ended his career and he had a hard time psychologically kind of not wanting to hurt himself like that again to the point where he might not, I mean, they told him they might have to amputate his leg. That's the severity of his injury. So obviously, psychologically, it was very um, anxiety producing to come back and try to push his body to certain limits. And he told the trainer that he needed to talk and the trainer connected him with me and he was so worried about being seen with me that he would say, okay, Sarah, you go to this room and then you go in and I'll wait like 10 minutes and then I'll do a special knock on the door and then I'll come in and, and it was, it, we had to orchestrate it so that he did not feel there was anyone in the locker room that would see him reaching out for help or, or talking to me essentially. And fast forward now to this past year, I actually was able to ask the LA Kings to do a checkup from the neck up with every player that came back from the off season. When they went to see their eye doctor, or they saw their orthopedic, they saw the medical, they also saw me. And every single, play, every single player sat down to kind of check in on how are you doing neck up, right? How are you feeling? What's going on with you? Is there anything going on with your family? Is there anything that you're worried about? And we had a conversation and I was amazed. I was really waiting for the resistance to come of like, why are we doing this? Or, you know, why are you asking me these questions? And not one of the players had a problem with it. They were like, oh, cool. That's cool. And they filled out the little form and we sat and talked. And they're like, yeah, that's a good idea. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. After we finished that, I texted every single one of them to say it was great to meet you. You know, I, the, here's my information. And at least a handful reached out to say, hey, can I talk to you? I'd really like to set up an appointment. Uh, my wife is struggling. You know, we just moved here from Sweden. Is there any chance, you know, you could help her? So being able to find ways where we normalize the checking in seems to be a very powerful way to get men in a room to kind of talk and be able to know that that's something they can do and that they can actually find relief from and you know move their move themselves into a place that feels a little bit more supported and and healthy uh, the other thing with the clippers that i asked this year that um they 
fortunately introduced me to the team, even though I've been there for three or four seasons now. Um, and I asked if the head coach could say a few words, because what I find with men is if they have another man that they look up to, that they respect, that gives them permission and says, yes, this is important and this matters, they will allow themselves this, the equal permission to say, yeah, uh, okay, cool, right? Like other men who I respect and look up to who have been through the battles and who have I see as a warrior are open to do this than I am too. And that really helped with the kind of um, opening the door. So I, I think there's ways in which we can have, as you said, other people talk about when, when it's somebody who's been through it and they have a real genuine experience. It just normalizes that this, I can be a very successful person, I can accomplish a lot, but I still can need help and I still can need guidance. So thank you for you know this and I, I'm gonna turn it back to Drew for a summary and introductions. Thank you so much um, for that. And I think what we see is when there's access to a conversation, people are open to it. And I think it's where Bring Change to Mind mission to put people into rooms. Um, I've been a therapist for 22 years now, and it's just always struck me how much humans love to connect. And when we feel just the faintest glimmer of interest and curiosity combined with safety, we share what's going on with one another and we heal one another. And uh, what I love about Sarah's work is how it uh, poses this notion that I believe in. I think I'm here sitting with you today because of good treatment, not because I'm a successful man. I think I became a successful man through getting help. And when I think about all these men uh, and women uh, in a notion of exploration of the self and that this is a journey that we're all on together and that we walk arm in arm in a preventative way to get ahead of these issues as opposed to shamefully seeking me out. I just think that's where we want to be as a country and as a culture. So it's a treat to be with you all. I also am feeling very healthy because I had a session out there. Maybe you noticed the youngest mental health professional here, uh, Dr. Romeo uh, Richards. Uh, I don't know if you know Dr. Romeo, thank you. I was sitting out there and I want to just introduce some of our Bring to Change Mind family. I'm thrilled to welcome uh, Ian Michael Enriquez, who's the Youth Leadership Coordinator at the San Francisco Unified High uh, School District and the Bring Change to Mind faculty advisor and a Bring Change to Mind high school leader. Uh, these are the individuals who engage our youth. I asked Romeo, how'd you get involved? He said, Ian saw me, he invited me. It sounded cool, a conversation about mental health and social justice and I was in. And that's what it takes in our schools. It takes someone looking out for our kids and saying, let's talk about this stuff. Romeo uh, Richards is going to come on up to the stage, and he's going to share his insights on the topic. He serves on the SFUSD's Student Health Advisory Board. He's been a wellness coach, a wellness ambassador at Lincoln High School. He's interested in learning Chinese and uh, Arabic and traveling the world. And he did give me a great session out there, because as a young man like Romeo, I wanted to travel the world, and I got to just a little bit. And it, just like you said, completely set things up for me and expanded my worldview. And then he said, someday, I really want to have motivation. I want to have a family. I want to get married by the time I'm 30. And Dr. Romeo, it was a great session because I got married before I was 30. <laughs> and it's great motivation to have people that you love and you care for to, to keep you doing the good work. And so Romeo is going to come up and share uh, some, of, some of his thoughts about male mental health. Come on up. All right, hello everyone. So, you know, I'm gonna be talking about men's mental health. I'm just gonna be talking about the history and the reason why men are told to man up, not cry, you know, don't show no emotions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All throughout time, men have been the ones going to war, and on the battlefield, you don't want weak men fighting. You want strong men. Imagine if a man said, I don't want to disarm the bomb, I'm too scared, or I don't want to fight. If everyone just stops fighting, the world will be better, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have lost the war because the other side, well, they have this thing called toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity is important during times of war. You needed men to be strong. You needed men to not be scared. You needed men who didn't cry. You needed toxic masculinity. 
The reason I bring up war is because this country's whole entire history is war. From the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, Mexican-American War, I mean, what? The uh, First World War, the Great Depression, World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam. What do you think was going to happen? They brought, you know, people brought home this type of mentality of men at war, of do not cry. Now, World War I, through the Great, De through the Great Depression to World War II, the, pe the people or the kids that were born in, at, in World War I fought in World War II. That was a back-to-back -back war, back-to-back. -back. There was no breaks in between, all right? That's our whole entire, you know, country's history is war and fighting. And who fought in all those wars? It wasn't women. It was us. We had to, you know. The men from those wars brought home trauma and PTSD, and most importantly, the mindset of men at war. And this doesn't stop with them. It has led to generational trauma, and this continues to this day. This mindset is pivotal for war, but it is not for a peaceful society. So many young men are told to hide their, their emotions. We are told this not just from men, but also women. All of this has led to an overwhelming stigma and why 80% of suicide cases are men. In the world of survival, many men feel that no one listens to them or even cares to listen, or they listen and use their words against them. Cultural changes need to happen, but it won't happen overnight. So where do we begin? We need role models, men who can tell young men that they can open up, they need to prioritize self-care, and that seeking help is not a weakness. We need men to lead, you know? We need men who are successful to guide the, the younger men. Because men, we, we want to feel needed. If you don't feel needed, then well, and, if when, and when nobody cares about your feelings, well, this is what happens, you know? I told you, I wanna be just like him, you know? I, I wanna come in here with a suit, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, give y'all some knowledge, <laughs> guide the young men, that's the type of man that I wanna be, and especially I wanna be that type of example for my future, you know, my future family. <sighs> so, I really do want to be a role model for the kids in this city to, you know, and especially for young men, because a lot of young men, we're giving up. We're not going to college. We're just sitting at home, playing video games all day. We're not, we're not doing nothing. We're, we're giving up. It's sad, to be honest. It's very sad. Also, People like these philosophers, like, well, old philosophers back in time, you know, Socrates, Charles Darwin, and Confucius. No, some of these men weren't, you know, the most, the most rich. They, they weren't warlords, you know? They, you know, they wasn't kicking down walls and all that. They just spoke, they just spoke their mind. They spoke and guided other men to be better leaders. And you know, that's what we need right now. Because if men are just sitting at home not doing nothing, then well, we need somebody to guide us. That's what we need. We, ve we, we, we really need it. And, and that's what we're doing uh, at SFUSD with Bring Change to Mind. <laughs> that's it. There's a multitude of, uh, you know, multitude of factors that plays into this, uh, but it's so many layers, there's so many layers that you can't even really fix this in about, you know, a couple days or a couple years. This is a, it's a long thing, you know. Just like I said, with war and needing toxic masculinity for that, where do we draw the line with men expressing themselves and having to live in a peaceful society? And then when all, and then when, you know, all hell breaks loose, then what? And I'm still trying to find that answer. I'm like, how can we, how can we balance this? Because we, that's what we need is balance. We don't need com a complete one side, because when you have one side, then well, the scale tips over.
and then you're a, a dictatorship. So. You all right? Also, uh, not caring about men's emotions is one thing, but also one one other important factor is relationships, and then also motivation for men. You know, I feel like a lot of men are giving up because they don't have no motivation. They don't have no leader. The motivation, where it comes from, for me, is that I get to support my family. Now, a lot of dudes are out here, we're lonely, we have nobody to talk to. You know, I'm pretty like that's true for a lot of us. We say that we have friends, but when you call them, they don't pick up. When you tell them about stuff, they don't listen. They're like, eh, it's whatever. Uh, they cheated, eh, whatever now. Who cares, you know? That's what, that's what we get. And what really motivates a man is a family. And if we're all just getting married at, at later ages, then well, no young man is gonna go to work and just work for themselves. When you have a family, you, you have some, you know, you have a reason to get up and go to work. Otherwise, you just go to work just to make some money. But no, making that money is meant for your family. But making the money now is just, you know, just for yourself because you have no, because, well, People don't really need you no more since, you know, before it was men who were going out and, you know, getting the jobs and providing for family, you know. But now that women could also do it, where does that leave us men? Because we had a purpose, so what is our purpose now? And I really thought about that for a long time. What is my purpose? And to be honest, I still don't know. But I feel like now I have some type of understanding and it's to be to be the best, to be the best version of myself. So, because I can still be a provider, you know, nothing is stopping me from that. You know, people, you know, women also going to work, that's not, that's not stopping me from being a provider. That's not, you know, that's not stopping people from being like, yeah, I need him, he's a strong leader. That's not stopping me. So, you know, when I thought it over, I'm like, yeah, I'm tripping too much, you know. I'm, I'm thinking about it too much, I gotta chill out. So, now, now, my reason for wanting to travel, you know, as Drew said, is that when you get to, uh, you know, experience different cultures, you meet different people, and, well, you know, very pleasant experience. But anyway, nah, whatever. <laughs> See y'all later. Listen to the voice of youth and the voices of youth tonight. We have one more coming. So our time is getting short. Bernice has ceded uh, her spot on our fourth flash talk. And I am going to cut short and focus on one of the implicit topics tonight, not so explicit. Anti-reductionism. Mental illness is a brain disease. That was thought to be the answer to stigma. It doesn't work. Mental illness has biological roots, especially its most severe forms. But mental illness exists, as we've heard all evening, in various cultures and contexts and sexual orientations and uh, racial and ethnic groups. We have to combine stories and narratives with science if we're going to make any progress. So I'm going to um, trouble you for a minute and, and read something. So this came about, immodestly, a few weeks ago when my wife Kelly and I went to Cambridge, Mass, and I was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Glenn Close, well, hold your applause, Glenn Close is in this year's inducted class and will be in Cambridge next spring. And we're going to nominate, as soon as the nominations are open, Bernice, so she can be in the class after that. <laughs> if you get inducted into this esteemed society, you need to write a one-page letter of acceptance. Or they, I guess they would take you, but they say they won't take you. So I'm going to read an excerpt from the letter I wrote 
that I think has a message that comes out mo most powerfully in discussing my family and at the very end. I owe a huge debt to many people. These include particularly my father, my late father, Professor Virgil Hinshaw, a philosopher of science, who studied with international American Academy member Albert Einstein. My late mother, Aline Pryor Hinshaw, a historian and English teacher. And my sister, Sally Pryor Hinshaw, in the vanguard of holistic medical education through expert patient simulation, now attaining international efforts. I pay tribute as well to my loving wife, Dr. Kelly Campbell. Kelly, please stand for one second, even though you'll hate me for doing this. <laughs> Waving is fine. A scholar and advocate for the foundational years of child development. Our three sons, Jeffrey W. Hinshaw, John W. Noikam, and Evan R. Hinshaw, whose interests span finance, music and visual arts, global economics, literature, and philosophy. Note the blending of both arts and sciences in this legacy, as befits the name of the American Academy. Alas, the many students, friends, and colleagues I've had the pleasure of encountering throughout my life are far too numerous to mention. Students in the Hinshaw Lab, please stand up or wave. There they are. <laughs> Crucially, my father experienced serious misdiagnosed and maltreated mental illness throughout his life, just like so many other family members. Professionals ordered complete silence, especially during his long absences, often in inhumane snake pit facilities, as mental disorder was deemed by his own doctor to be too devastating to disclose to children. Since his first revelation to me when I was 18 years of age, and since his subsequent diagnosis of bipolar disorder, which I facilitated, I have dedicated my life to psychology, uncovering the biological and social roots of mental illness. I have also prioritized narrative accounts, along with policy and science, to combat the stigma still surrounding mental and neurodevelopmental conditions. Indeed, it will require the confluence of developmental science, clinical science, and neuroscience with humanization and narrative to advance this key frontier for human rights. I accept this honor in the spirit of promoting arts and sciences, narrative accounts and empirical data. I contend that the integration of the humanities and the sciences remains the only viable path forward for the future of our species. Go to bed, reductionism. Let's integrate. <laughs> we have one more youth voice, and this is Aria Ronnie Sindeldecker. I met Ronnie a year and a half ago when she introduced herself to me in an email, and we did a video taping for one of her several uh, documentaries she's done, and uh, she's a ninth grader now at Mountain View High School. She's an advocate and activist for mental health and is president of her high school, Bring Change to Mind Club. She's a junior intern for the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and a youth consultant for the Stanford Center for Youth Mental Health. Can you really do UCSF and Stanford together? I guess you can. <laughs> and a consultant for the Children's Partnership's $10 million peer-to-peer -peer rollout. She is also a documentarian, as I mentioned, having created two award-winning short films that spotlight issues surrounding mental health. She also serves on the Youth Advisory Board of the California Coalition for Youth and the California Children's Trust. Ronnie, could you come up and share a few thoughts? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I am 14 and I could have not imagined speaking here just two years ago when my advocacy started. Just to kind of start it off, I grew up in a family that talked about mental health challenges a lot because my mom, she grew up with OCD and anxiety and she couldn't talk about it. And I don't want any youth to ever feel like that. But look at our youth now. Because of the pandemic, there have been so many isolated teens who can't talk about how they're feeling. They're going through depression, anxiety, self-harm, and suicidal thoughts. So in my seventh grade year, I decided to create a empathizers club, a mental health anti-stigma club. And I realized how hard it was to create it because of all the red tape. 
But in the summer before my eighth grade year, I met Dr. Steve Hinshaw and but when I was making my second documentary, and he introduced me eventually to Pamela. Oh, <laughs> I didn't see you there. Um, and that's really where my Bring Change to Mind journey started. I was able to easily get support from administration because Bring Change to Mind is a popular and a well-known organization. We there was there's such an amazing community behind it of thousands of teens who support each other and are so so supportive of each other and work with each other days on end. And we receive so many resources and, and documents on how to create and sustain these clubs. And not too far into the school year, we received free t-shirts for our entire club. So at Bring Change to Mind, we have an army behind us to bring awareness to mental health and destigmatize the school campus. And currently in our club at MVHS, we have about 40 members. And because we have so many members, we created a committee system where all students have the ability to have leadership and ownership over different aspects of our club. And some of the personal things I've seen in our club is that it's, it's improved the mental health of our members. It has made them more self-aware. It has given leadership opportunities to those who might not normally consider themselves leaders. It gives them a movement to be part of. And it makes them leaders for their generation. And it's given a lot of students outside opportunities. And kind of taking a step back, everyone is always talking about mental health, about the youth voice and how we need to amplify it. But most of those, most of those people are adults. But the amazing thing about Bring Change to Mind is that it listens to the youth voice, encourages the youth voice, uh, raises up the youth voice. And that's part of the reason why I'm so proud to be part of Bring Change to Mind. Thank you so much um, to all of our amazing scientists, Bernice and Steve. I really appreciate your leadership. And to all of our scientific advisors that are here tonight, um, and many that are not here tonight, we, uh, we invite you to this dialogue series that we're going to be continuing over the next couple of years. Um, it's been a really fascinating journey over the last 12 years. Um, Glenn, thank you for your fearless leadership, um, and to our amazing board that's here in the room. We have a big night tomorrow at Revels and Revelations. I know some of you will be with us um, and look forward to seeing you as well. well get, grab your details later. Um, but again, just we're very, very grateful for all of you and especially to April, to Romeo, to Ronnie. Those, you are, you are the reason that we get up every morning and we do the work that we do, know that. And we are gonna do everything that we can to support you and I know Everyone in this room will do the same. So we appreciate your support. Um, please seek out any of the board members, scientists. Um, you know how to reach us at bringchangetomind.org. Um, we'd love for you to get uh, involved in our, in our journey of change. And uh, thank you very much. Have a great evening.